we're going to talk about the tissue level of organization, so tissues in the human body. Now, in this chapter, we're going to review things like the epithelial tissues, connective tissues. We'll go through some different body membranes. We'll talk about what a membrane is and what the different types are. Then we'll wrap up with muscle, nervous tissue, and some ideas of aging within tissue as well. Most of today's lecture is going to focus on epithelial connective. Those are the kind of the bigger categories of tissues. Um, and then the last section, you guys, is muscle and nervous, which is less types of these, and then it's easier to talk about. Um, so you guys, <clears throat> in our bodies, there's trillions of cells. Okay, so our entire body is made of trillions of cells. In fact, uh, it's estimated that the average human body has about 100 trillion cells within it, which is like a lot of cells, right? So when these cells come together, they can form a tissue. So when multiple cells come together, they form some sort of tissue. And this is where cells in a given location share a particular function, like a common function, and we call this a tissue. And our body is made of lots of different tissue types. Now, it's human nature to like to put things into certain categories. So what you'll find then is that we've defined these tissues based on how they look, right? And um, off, off also how they function. So a tissue is just a group of similar cells uh, that perform a common function. And um, there's four main tissue types in the body. We have epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. So uh, where do you find epithelial tissues? Skin is an example. Lining spaces, including body cavities, or within organs that have space within that organ, right? So the inside of blood vessels, the inside of your respiratory tract, genitourinary tract, digestive tract, all that on the inside has an epithelium that lines those walls, okay? Uh, connective tissues you find kind of filling the spaces in between tissues. So connective tissues will help support epithelial tissues. They're going to surround and support muscle tissue. And uh, think of the connective tissues as like the filler material here. Muscle tissue you're going to find throughout the body, and there's different subtypes. But all muscle tissue acts to produce force that's going to help do things like move substances in your body, store materials, um, or even move your entire body around. So we'll talk about that later. And then nervous tissue is excitable, which means that it can transmit impulses. Um, it can also be excited by other packets of information or nerve impulses. And that nervous tissue can kind of direct the activities of other tissues. So for instance, nervous tissue, which includes like your brain, spinal cord, and nerves, all that nervous tissue can do things like excite glands in your body. So you get excited gland to like sec make a secretion. Or nervous tissue can excite muscle to contract, right? So we think about nervous tissue as being sort of like the controlling tissue of these four types. Now, all of these tissues will vary in their structure and function, as well as their content, okay? So although we, we call these tissues, and all tissues have at least one type of cell, uh, these different tissues will have either... Um, Lots of cells or maybe not so many cells. Maybe one cell type or many cell types. Otherwise, these tissues can have other components like fibers and ground substance. Um, and it's the components of these different things, or the, sorry, the proportion of these components that really defines what these tissues are. And we'll, we'll go through what that means a little, in a little bit, you guys. Now, extracellular matrix is all the material you find outside of a cell in a tissue. So extracellular matrix would be like all of the extracellular material, so things you find outside of a cell that fill that tissue. This could be a lot of water, could be a lot of solutes, could be protein, could be fat, um, and it could be just things that kind of fill the rest of the tissue other than, other than the cell itself. That's extracellular matrix. Now these tissues can vary in the quantity and composition of their extracellular matrix, which we'll go into later too. So one thing that's important to note, you guys, is that we define these based on their composition. And we'll talk about what the composition of these tissues are and the subtypes of each. So we're going to first talk about the epithelial tissues. And so epithelial tissues line every body surface and body cavities. So if you're thinking about like a body surface, that would be skin, right? Well, skin is in part an epithelial tissue. So if you're looking at the part of skin you can see externally, that's the epithelium of skin, okay? Now, epithelial tissues, just in general, we say cover and line body surfaces and spaces. So if you think about any space in your body, it's probably most likely lined with an epithelial tissue. Okay, so think about like the inside of your blood vessels, all along the inside of your digestive tract, respiratory tract, genitourinary tracts, 
that's going to be lined with an epithelium. Now, uh, also glands are made of epithelial tissues because often glands will have a space on the inside. So for instance, if it's a, if it's a gland that makes a secretion like sweat or oil, you're going to find an epithelium that lines the duct of that gland, and the epithelium of that duct can make the secretion. Okay? Now, uh, it turns out that epithelial tissues possess little to no extracellular matrix. So what this means then is that epithelial tissues are mostly cells. So they're, they're made of densely packed cells. That's what an epithelial tissue is made of. Okay? So very densely packed cells. Think of like an epithelial tissue, guys, as like a brick wall. Right? If you think about a brick wall, it's a lot of bricks and not a whole lot of anything else. Right? You do have some mortar that can hold those bricks together. But think about if each brick is a cell, then you have lots of cells that are densely packed that can form a wall of tissue. That's an epithelial tissue. Okay? So um, there were, therefore, we define epithelial tissues as having cellularity. So cellularity is where we, we talk about epithelial tissues being, as being comprised of almost entirely cells with very little material outside of that. So it's mostly just made of cells. But these cells are bound together by what we call intercellular junctions. So all these cells are linked up together. Like you don't find an epithelial tissue where cells are just kind of loosely floating around, right? Like if you think about the epithelium of your skin, bless you, if the skin cells weren't tightly held together, every time you picked up on your skin, it should just tear away, right? Well, it doesn't happen, though, because these cells are so tightly interlinked that together it forms a really tough barrier, okay? So that although they're mostly made of cells, those cells are very tightly held together by different types of intercellular junctions, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, epithelial tissues also have polarity, which means they have ends. So we have an apical surface and a basal surface. The apical surface of an epithelium is exposed to the space, okay? So if you're looking at skin, and you're looking at the surface of skin, what side of your cell would this be if you're looking at it? Like on your hand or something. You're right, it's the apical surface. And then the basal surface would be deeper. You won't see that on your skin. It's going to be the part of the epithelium that's deeper in the tissue. That's what's tightly held to the underlying connective tissue. So the basal surface of epithelium is what's anchored to the underlying connective tissue. Okay? So the apical surface is exposed to the space. The basal surface is anchored below. Okay? And we'll, we'll see some examples of that. Now, all epithelial tissues have to have an attachment. They, also, they have to attach to something. Because if they didn't, they just would kind of float away and drift away. Now, um, all epithelial tissues have an underlying connective tissue. In fact, every single epithelial tissue in your body has an underlying basement membrane, which is basically like a big, thick layer of fibers, thick Velcro, that these cells can stick to. And they hold on to that really tightly. In fact, what surface of the epithelial cells would attach to your basement membrane then? You got it, the basal surface. So the basal surface is what attaches to the basement membrane. Okay? Now, it also turns out that epithelial tissues are also avascular, meaning that they don't have blood vessels. So if you cut an epithelium, would it bleed? No. In fact, if you do have a cut and that cut is bleeding, you've gone through the epithelial tissue into the underlying connective tissue and then therefore ruptured a blood vessel, vessel in the underlying connective tissue. Like epithelial tissues are avascular. They don't have any blood vessels. So what this means then is that all epithelial tissues have to get their nutrients from an underlying connective tissue because epithelial tissues don't have blood vessels traversing through them. they got to get their nutrients from blood vessels found in deeper tissues. But you might wonder, well, how do nutrients get from blood vessels to the epithelial tissue? Diffusion, right? Because if the epithelium is attached to a basement membrane and that's attached to an underlying connective tissue, well, the nutrients can diffuse through the solution of the underlying connective tissue, and then those nutrients can diffuse up to the epithelium to nourish those cells. And so we said that all epithelial tissues are avascular. Now, epithelial tissues are also innervated. The word innervation means that they have a lot of nerve fibers within them. So that means that epithelial tissues can actually be involved with reception of, of different stimuli. And a stimulus is just a packet of information. So what are some things you can feel with your skin? Like we can feel things with our skin. Skin's in epithelium. So what can we feel? What can we feel with this epithelium? Temperature. Temperature, like heat, like hot, cold. Good. What else can we feel? Pain. Yeah, like if you cut, it can be painful. How about vibration, pressure, just even just general touch, right? 
Well, some of the, that sensation is picked up by the nerve fibers that we have in the epithelium of our skin. In fact, all epithelial tissues are innervated. So what does this mean about the epithelium of our respiratory tract? Bless you. So all along the respiratory tract, you guys, we have nerve endings that are in there. What do you guys think the function of those nerve endings would be then in your respiratory tract? In the uh, epithelium. Why even have nerve endings along your respiratory tract? Yeah, if you inhale something, that needs to be coughed out, right? If you inhale any foreign debris, the nerve endings in the epithelium can maybe sense that and then help initiate a cough reflex to get that out of your lungs, right? Um, what about the nerve endings, let's say, in the epithelium of your digestive tract? What might be the point of those? Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, we can have nerve fibers in our uh, stomach that way, our nervous system knows that there's actually food there, right? And those, some of those nerve endings are actually found in the epithelium of the stomach. Not all of them, but some of them can, which means you can sense the contents of the stomach. So epithelial tissues are innervated. So innervation means it has nerve, nerve supply. Also, epithelial tissues have a high regenerative capacity, meaning that they can gener regenerate really quickly. So can you guys think of any epithelium that might encounter a lot of damage or stress and therefore need to divide really rapidly? Yeah, skin, absolutely. Um, you know, skin takes a beating throughout the day, right? Um, when you're sitting down, the skin on your, on your butt is being stretched upon, right? When you're wearing clothes, your clothes can rub up against your skin, right? And it's really dry in Denver, too, which doesn't help. Um, in fact, you replace the epithelium of your skin about once every two months. So think about yourself two months ago. You had a completely different epithelium of skin. Where does that go, though? Yeah, exactly. All over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so what, is, what do epithelial tissues look like? Well, we saw a lot of those in lab earlier. So uh, what we're looking at here, you guys, is basically uh, a little cube of tissue. And if you cut out that cube of tissue, well, we can see that there would be a space up here. Here's the epithelial tissue near that space. We can see that these cells have kind of a columnar shape. And we have one row of cells. So what type of, cell, what type of epithelium would this be then? Simple columnar, you got it. So one row means it's simple. And if there's column-shaped cells, we call it columnar. What surface of the epithelium is this? Apical. How about down here? Basal. Remember, the basal surface is what's attached to the basement membrane and underlying connective tissue. So here's the underlying connective tissue down here, you guys. In fact, this underlying connective tissue would have blood vessels in it. So the only way this epithelium gets nutrient <coughs> supply is from the underlying blood vessels in that connective tissue below it so that nutrients from blood can diffuse up through tissue and then eventually get to these cells. Like this could be a tissue inside of your digestive tract because pretty much the entirety of your digestive tract is lined with a simple columnar epithelium. Now, uh, some functions of epithelial tissues would be involved like with protection. So we know that skin is a really good protective barrier can you guys imagine any other epithelia that would need to protect really well? Like, where do you find epithelium? Let's get one example. Let's say lining of your stomach. So how would the epithelium inside your stomach be involved with any kind of protection? Yeah. Well, you have, like, high concentrations of Yes, exactly. The inside of the stomach is a very acidic environment. And that acid in the stomach could potentially damage underlying tissue. So it means that the epithelium that lines the inside of your stomach needs to be able to protect the deeper tissues from the acidity within it. So that, that's one example of protection. And re really every single epithelial tissue in your body, you guys, is some sort of protective barrier. You know, think about the epithelium lining your respiratory tract. You don't want to just absorb every single particle you inhale, right? Um, think about the epithelium along like the genitourinary tracts. You know, you don't want substances crossing those membranes either. So uh, epithelial tissues form a nice physical protective barrier. Some epithelial tissues are permeable, meaning that they can have substances cross that membrane. So can you guys think? imagine any epithelial tissues you might want to have absorption across? Yeah, intestines, exactly. If you're absorbing a tremendous amount of nutrients from your food, that's some selective permeability. But do you want to absorb everything in the digestive tract into your body? No. no, right? There's bacteria in there. You don't want to absorb those. So we say that epithelial tissues have a selective permeability, meaning that they can, they can help absorb some things but prevent other things from crossing. Okay? 
or going the other way. Some epithelial tissues make secretions like mucus um, so that you can actually have secretion of mucus going across the epithelium and entering a space. Think of like any sort of mucusy or wet area of your body, that's going to be a, an epithelial membrane, which is a mucous membrane. Think of like the oral cavity, um, you know, genital urinary tracts, that kind of stuff. Uh, we also know that, so that they're involved in secretion. We also know that epithelial tissues are involved with sensation. So what helps epithelial tissues sense something? Nerve endings, you got it. So it, it turns out that epithelial tissues are innervated, right? So we got a lot of nerve endings in there. But it, there are also some specialized epithelial cells that can also be involved with sensation. We'll get to the, back to the more of this next week uh, when we talk about skin because there are specialized cell types in skin that can actually respond to things like touch. And then those will activate nerve endings nearby, which then carry those, that information to your brain so then you can, you can sense touch and skin. It's pretty amazing. Now, uh, all epithelial tissues have an underlying basement membrane. Now, for one, the basement membrane is sort of a barrier between the epithelium and underlying connective tissue. And the basement membrane has several different functions. Uh, for one, it's an attachment of epithelium. So the epithelium needs to attach to something. That's one of the functions of basement membrane. Second function of basement membrane is that it's also a selective barrier. Think of the basement membrane like a coffee filter, right? Where larger particles can't cross that coffee filter but smaller molecules like water and small ions can cross, right? And it would make sense how you would want a nice selective barrier here because you don't want typically large molecules being absorbed by your body or being lost out of your body, right? Think about the digestive tract. You want to absorb nice small molecules that have already been digested, and those can diffuse through the cells of your digestive tract, the epithelium, through the basement membrane, okay, because they're small enough. But larger molecules like bacteria, or I say molecule, like a larger cell, which includes large molecules, like a bacterial cell or maybe a parasite, you don't want it to just get absorbed in your body. And even if it did slip through the cells, you still have a basement membrane that's an additional selective barrier to prevent larger molecules from being absorbed. Okay? In fact, you guys have all encountered this before. Like, have you guys ever had a cut on skin where it doesn't bleed, but it kind of oozes, right? Not really pus, but kind of a watery secretion. So if it didn't bleed, that cut is only in the epithelium because all epithelial tissues are avascular. avascular. Good. But if it's oozing water, where's that water coming from, do you guys think? Deep to the basement membrane, like the underlying connective tissue. In fact, that water is just kind of being pushed up through the basement membrane up into the cut. Right? It's not bleeding, though, because you haven't gone through the basement membrane. But what you're seeing, though, when it kind of oozes instead of bleeding, is the fluid from the underlying connective tissue being forced up through the basement membrane. But let's say in that cut, where it doesn't bleed but kind of oozes, do you think that bacteria could cross through that basement membrane really well? Not really well. Yeah, because the basement membrane is a protective barrier. Some might get across, but uh, many of those will be protected against crossing because you have a basement membrane, which is like a coffee filter that allows prevents larger things from, from crossing. So it's an additional barrier. Um, now, earlier we talked about how epithelial tissues were very cellular, which means they were really densely packed cells. But if you have densely packed cells, you need to have intercellular junctions, which hold those cells together. And we have four main types of intercellular junctions here. We got tight junctions, adhering junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. So the tight junctions are involved with waterproofing. Okay, so they prevent water from passing between cells. Uh, the desmosomes are more of a structural component. So they, can, they can hold these cells together really tightly. Uh, gap junctions allow for communication between cells. And then the, these adhering junctions are also involved with uh, helping the cells uh, be held together as well as to the underlying tissue. So if we look at a picture of what these look like, you guys, um, and if we zoom in back on that same picture we saw earlier, looking at our epithelial tissues here, we got lots of cells side by side but these cells are held tightly together. So if we zoom in here on the spaces between these cells, you can see that there are all these kind of things that look, looks like rivets or something that hold these cells together tightly. So the tight junctions, uh, they talk about like, like the rivets between cells. The tight junctions, actually, could you light for us? Thank you. So the tight junctions, you can see really well 
um, here, the, the, these like, little rows of protein. And what these rows of protein do is they fuse the, the plasma membranes of these adjacent cells together. So the plasma membranes are like stuck together, then it's really difficult for molecules to slip between those cells, right? So it's difficult for molecules to pass between the cells because those tight junctions are blocking away. And so tight junctions are involved mostly with water protein. So what are some epithelial tissues you might not want to have a lot of water crossing? Bladder. Yeah, so the bladder. Like you don't want urine inside the bladder being absorbed back into your body, right? So let's say, let's say if there was urine up in here, you don't want the water in urine to pass between cells and then be absorbed back into your bloodstream. That wouldn't be a very effective way to eliminate those wastes, right? Uh, somebody said skin, and you're precisely right. If you didn't have a skin, you would dehydrate really, really rapidly. You know, so skin actually prevents dehydration because skin cells are also packed full of tight junctions, which prevents the water of your body, bless you, from leaving your skin between those cells. You wouldn't want that to happen. In fact, that doesn't happen in significant quantities. So skin is protective in that regard. So tight junctions are involved with waterproofing. In fact, you can, you can expect to find these in most epithelial tissues because you don't want a lot of water crossing epithelial barriers. Uh, over here, you guys, we see the desmosomes. Okay, And uh, actually, this is called the adhering junctions. I'm sorry. So uh, these adhering junctions can just help, like, hold the cells really tightly together. Um, down here, we can see our uh, desmosomes. And these desmosomes uh, also hold the cells really, really tightly together. So what would be some epithelial tissues that you want to have these cells really tightly held together and that makes that epithelium really tough? Around your lungs? Skin would be an excellent example. Uh, we'll come back to the lung thing. But skin's easy to think about because, you know, you have a lot of cells that make it up, right? And you need it to be tough. If it weren't tough, it would just would slough off of your body. In fact, what do you guys think would happen if someone had a disease where these desmosomes weren't created properly? Let's say they're weaker. Um, is Steven Johnson syndrome, does that have to do with that or no? A little bit. A little bit. It's similar to Steven Johnson's. That's gross. Yeah. So, but what do you guys think would happen if you had a g disease where these desmosomes weren't like functioning normally and they were weaker? Let's say the skin. Yeah, you'd have a lot of exposure. Some more wounds, right? Like open wounds and sores. In fact, there's an autoimmune disease where someone's immune system can attack these desmosomes, okay? And it's called pemphigus vulgaris. And that's basically where your immune system attacks these desmosomes and the skin starts to slough off. Imagine every time you touch your skin, just the bare, like the tiniest little bit of pressure would cause your skin to just slough away from your body. And that can happen. So these desmosomes are really important in providing some structure and support for your body, okay, or skin at least. Now, uh, what about these gap junctions? So we talked about gap junctions. Gap junctions are like protein tubes. In fact, uh, that's what this is showing here, you guys. So if you zoom in on a gap junction, you'll see it's just a little tube of protein that connects the fluid environment of one cell to the next. What this means then is that it allows for molecules to spread <coughs> from between cells. Like under what circumstances would you want molecules to spread from one cell to the next through a tube? What do you guys think these are functioning in? Like what do they do? If you have molecules spread from one cell to the next. Yes, nutrient exchange. What if I told you guys in bone, that's how nutrients are passed along. So bone cells pass nutrients from cell to cell through gap junctions. That way when one cell picks up nutrients, those nutrients can spread to the next cell through those protein tubes that are connecting the fluid environments of those cells together. Or in your heart, these gap junctions are used for communication. So electrical currents spread through your heart cells through these gap junctions. So what if you had a disease where these were blocked? What do you guys think would happen to bone, maybe, if these were blocked? Yeah, maybe some, some bone death, which could lead to osteoporosis. 
Uh, what about in your heart? Could your heart muscle cells communicate? No, exactly. So you see this under conditions like if your blood becomes too acidic, these proteins can change shape, the tube can collapse, and it prevents proper communication between these cells. And so that can happen in your heart too. So just to summarize this, you guys, what's the function of a tight junction? Waterproofing. Waterproofing. How about uh, adhered junctions and desmosomes? Hold cells together. Hold cells together tightly. Structure yep, structure support. And then how about gap junctions? Good. Communication, holding cells together to some degree, and nutrient dispersal. But really just think about in general, you guys, just passing molecules from one cell to the next, which can include nutrient exchange or cell-to-cell -cell communication. So that's the function of a gap junction. So you guys want to know that. Um, and so that's what these next slides talk about, you guys. So tight junctions in circle cells near the apical surface, they prevent molecules from passing between cells. So we call these the gatekeepers between the external and internal environment. So they prevent molecules from passing between your epithelial tissues. Adherence junctions and desmosomes are going to be things that help support the structure of those cells. And so you're going to find these thickened protein plaques that really hold these cells together tightly. If you lack desmosomes or adherence junctions, then these cells can't be held together as tightly and the tissue will be weaker as a result. Now, the gap junctions are fluid-filled channels that, cr that connect the cytoplasms of cells together, and that way molecules can spread from one cell to the next. So what are the, you want to know the functions of these components. In fact, I want to show you guys a picture of that uh, condition I was talking about. So if we, if we see pemphigus vulgaris, um, this, is what the, this is what your skin would look like as a result. So you guys see these big old sores, these big wounds? It's because the skin is weakened due to an autoimmune disease where someone's immune system is actually attacking the desmosomes that hold their skin cells together. This isn't from like a lot of trauma, by the way. Like this isn't as though someone like fell off their motorcycle and slid on their back. This would be sort of a moderate amount of trauma from just like laying in bed, in which stretches on your skin and they can pull the skin cells apart. So you end up with these large wounds here. That would be a disease of desmosomes. Yes? Oh, I've seen that video too. No, it's similar. It's similar. It's different, but it's similar. Yeah, I, I've that video is really sad, actually. I, We'll, we'll come back to that later in pathophysiology, but yeah, that, I've seen that case before, and it was a YouTube video I saw, and it was this, this poor kid who's, he has a skin condition, his skin is weaker, and it has a tendency to slough off, he's got to take baths like several times a day, and he's wrapped in bandages, and he's expected to live like only 20 years, but he's, he has such a positive outlook on life, which is inspiring about the video, that's actually pretty cool, yes? Yeah. You mean like normal or abnormal? Have you ever seen that? Like if people's skin is so sensitive that it can touch, that like it'll touch us, so it's like literally right on their skin. Uh, maybe, like but that, that would just be some inflammation, which is uh, part of your immune response. Yes. Yeah, it's genetic. Yeah, it's genetic. It's inheritable, and it occurs about one in five million. Yeah. Well, you know, it's five five point three million people in Colorado. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just not super common, but it's interesting to consider. So, how are epithelial tissues classified? Well, we can classify epithelial tissues based on their cell shape and the number of layers. So, if you have one layer of cells, what's that called? System. Yep, and multiple. Layers? Stratified. stratified epithelium. Good. And then we talk we can talk about the shape of cells too. So we have the simple stratified epithelium. Remember, simple epithelium have one layer of cells. The stratified epithelium have multiple layers of cells. But then we also have one called the pseudo-stratified epithelium. This is like what we call an atypical epithelium, where it looks like it's stratified, but it's not actually stratified. The only type of pseudo-stratified epithelium we're gonna talk about is the pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar variety. 
which you find lining your respiratory tract. So if it if it's a pseudostratified ciliated columnar, you guys, that that's the only one we're going to talk about, and that's found in the respiratory tract. There are other varieties of pseudostratified epithelia, but they're more rare. When we say pseudo, we mean fake, right? So pseudostratified epithelium means it looks like it's it's stratified, but it's actually just one cell layer. Okay. Now um, what we see here then is that this would be a simple epithelium because it's one layer of cells. This would be a stratified epithelium because you can see there's many layers of cells or multiple layers of cells here. Now, we can also classify epithelial tissues based on their cell shape. So if they're squamous, they're flattened. Cuboid means cube-shaped, and columnar means column-shaped. So they're wider than they are tall. So going back to the last slide, what type of epithelium would you call this? Simple squamous. Good. How about this one? Yeah, this one's actually stratified squamous. But why not stratified cuboidal if you look down here? Nice, very good. So these epithelial tissues are classified based on how the cells look at the apical surface, not the basal surface. If you look at the, at the shape of these cells at the basal surface, you'd say, oh, this looks like stratified cuboidal. But that would be incorrect because they're actually classified by the shape of the cells at the apical surface. So we say that this is actually stratified squamous, not stratified cuboidal. So keep that in mind, you guys. That's, we'll come back to that later. So these stratified epithelia are classified by the shape of the cells at their apical, <coughs> apical surface, not the basal surface. Now, um, this is showing the shape of the cells again. So flattened cell is squamous, cube-shaped is cuboidal, and column-shaped is columnar. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, what this, sh what this table shows right here is basically all of the major epithelial tissues, so all the simple and stratified epithelium, and the different varieties of each. And it turns out that if you can imagine any sort of combination of simple with a cell shape, it exists. So if think about like uh, simple squamous, that exists. Simple cuboidal, that too. Simple columnar, all of those exist. Okay? Or stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, stratified columnar, all of those exist in the body. And you might wonder, why would you have so many, so many different varieties of epithelia? Well, it turns out that the number of cell layers and the shape of those cells gives those epithelial tissues a specific function. Okay? So if they're thin, like if they're a simple epithelium and the epithelium is really thin, do you think that would be a nice protective epithelium if they're thin? No. So would you expect skin to be a simple epithelium? No, absolutely not, because simple epithelium would, would not protect very well. But you would expect that if it's a protective epithelium, you would want stratified cells, right? How about the cell shape? Um, We'll actually, we'll come back to cell shape later because uh, I don't want to get to that yet. But what this is saying, you guys, is just how these are defined. And you guys can guess what these definitions are based on the name. So if I said we had a stratified columnar epithelium, how many cell layers would there be? Two. Multiple. Two or more, right? At least two, if not more. How about the shape of those cells? Columnar. But the columnar cells would need to be at the basal or apical surface? Apical. Apical, exactly. So if it was column-shaped at the basal surface, but cuboid-shaped near the apical surface, it would not be stratified columnar. It would be stratified cuboidal because these cells are named, I'm sorry, the tissue is named for the shape of the cells at the apical surface, not the basal surface. Okay. All right, cool, guys. So what we're going to do next is move on to talk about all the different types of epithelium, the major types of epithelium in the body, where they're found, and the functions of each. Okay. So we're going to first start with the simple squamous epithelium. Now, if it's simple, how many cell layers? One layer. So you get a single layer of cells. And their shape? Flattened, right? Kind of pancake shaped, so they're flattened. So a single layer of flat cells. Do you think this would be a very protective epithelium? No. But it would be good at nutrient exchange because it's so thin. So you're going to find simple squamous epithelium in the parts of your body where you need nutrient exchange to occur very rapidly. Think about in your lungs, like the alveoli of your lungs, which you guys saw in lab earlier. When you saw simple squamous, you were looking at lung tissue. So all the air sacs of your lungs where gases need to move back and forth very quickly, the epithelium that lines those air sacs of your lungs is a simple squamous epithelium because you want oxygen to be absorbed into your bloodstream really quickly and you want carbon dioxide to be expelled from your body really quickly. And gases can move across this simple squamous epithelium very fast because the epithelium is so 
thin. And by having a really thin epithelium, nutrient exchange can occur really, really quickly. Where else might you expect to find a simple squamous epithelium if it's involved in really rapid nutrient exchange? You might expect the intestines. And I'll tell you what, you, you don't find it in the intestines because simple squamous epithelium isn't that protective. Although in your intestines you want rapid nutrient exchange, a simple squamous epithelium wouldn't be protective enough. So a, it turns out in the intestines there's actually a different epithelium. It's simple, but not squamous because you need to have a little bit more protection because the simple squamous variety is not protective enough. But that, you're right. That would be a, a good place to guess where you might find one. That, inside your blood vessels. You got it. So your blood vessels, the inside of them, are lined with a simple squamous epithelium because inside of blood vessels, you want to have nutrient exchange between blood and the surrounding tissue very quickly. So you also find simple squamous epithelium lining the inside of blood vessels. Okay? You also find it forming the amniotic sac. So the amniotic sac in an embryo is made of a simple squamous epithelium, and that makes sense because you want nutrient exchange to also occur rapidly there with a growing embryo. So what about simple cuboidal epithelium? Well, simple cuboidal epithelium, well, uh, they're single layer of, of cube-shaped cells. These typically are found in glands of your body. And what I mean by glands, you can find them in certain glands, like some sweat glands can have simple cuboidal epithelium, um, mucus glands along your digestive and respiratory tracts can be lined with a simple cuboidal epithelium. And they're especially found in the tubules of your kidneys. Like, what were, what were some of the functions of kidneys going back to last week? Filtration and clearing out waste from blood. So if you think about this, you guys, in the tubules that line the inside of your kidneys, the epithelium of those tubules is involved with absorbing substances and secreting substances to make urine. Now, it's not a simple squamous epithelium because it's not protective enough, but it's simple cuboidal because you want it to be thin so nutrients can be, or wastes can be exchanged across that epithelium quickly, but it needs to be somewhat more protective because urine has some components that could damage your body. You know, like urine's kind of acidic, and you don't want that acidic urine damaging deeper tissues. So a simple cuboidal epithelium makes more sense here. So you're going to find simple cuboidal epithelium lining your kidney tubules. How do we know that this is the epithelium here and not like up here? Yes, you got to find your space. So find your space and then you're going to find the epithelium lining that space. We see that we have one layer of nuclei, so it's a, it's a simple epithelium. And these, sh these cells seem kind of cube shaped, so we call this a simple cuboidal epithelium. So where do you find simple cuboidal epithelium? Glands, kidney tubules. And what's it good for? Rapid, rapid nutrient exchange, uh, waste exchange, but it's a little bit more protective than simple squamous, right? Because the cells are thicker. And by having thicker cells, there's more places to put intercellular junctions. So that this, this epithelium is more protective than a simple squamous epithelium. Okay? All right. How about simple columnar? Well, we'd have a single layer of column-shaped cells. So where's our epithelium on this slide? What do, we gotta, what, do we, what do we wanna find first? Our space, and here it is, right? Well, here's the epithelium lining that space. So if you look at this, you can see a single row of nuclei. And what, do this, what does the shape of these cells look like? Well, they're definitely, I wouldn't say squamous because they're definitely not flattened, right? And I definitely wouldn't say cube-shaped because they seem to be really tall. So the best one here would be columnar. So you can see that this is a simple columnar epithelium. And you find simple columnar epithelium lining your digestive tract. So think about the inside of your stomach, the inside of your small intestine, the inside of your large intestine is a simple columnar epithelium. So knowing it lines your digestive tract, what do you guys think the function of this epithelium is then? Absorption of nutrients, right? But why not have a simple squamous or a simple cuboidal? Yes, this is more protective. You got it. So simple columnar, because they're column-shaped cells, you can actually fit in even more intercellular junctions. This is actually good at nutrient exchange or like nutrient absorption from food. 
but it's more protective than like the simple squamous or simple cuboidal epithelium. You know, there are a lot of substances in your digestive tract that you don't want to absorb in your body, especially bacteria. You know, there are more bacterial cells in the lumen of your gut than there are cells of your own body. And there's the potential to absorb these in your body, which could lead to bacteriemia, sepsis, and potentially death, right? So we kind of skirt this delicate balance between having an epithelium that can absorb quickly, right, so that we can get nutrients, but not having an epithelium that's so thin that bacteria can easily cross. So the good, um, healthy medium here is a simple columnar epithelium where it's still simple, so you can still get rapid exchange, but it's a columnar epithelium which provides some additional uh, protection here because you don't want to absorb bacteria into your body. Yes? So then all, all three types of epithelium do not contain all four types of epithelium? Potentially. Yes, that, there's the potential for that. And the difference, though, between their protectability is if you think about, like, on a columnar cell, cell to cell, there's a lot more space or surface area for those cells to connect, which means if you have a columnar cell, you can fit a lot more intercellular junctions between columnar cells versus squamous cells, which are flattened, so they have less space where they connect. So you can't fit that many junctions there. So by having a column-shaped cell, there's a lot more surface area for intercellular junctions to give even greater support um, versus like a simple squamous cell. Now, uh, the types of junctions that are there will depend on the function of this epithelium. You know, in the digestive tract, yes, you're going to find desmosomes and hemidesmosomes um, and definitely tight junctions. Now, whether or not gap junctions are here depends. Um, so it's not true that every epithelium has all four intercellular junctions but you're going to see a kind of a mixture of all those depending on the function of that epithelium. It's a good question. So what about ciliated simple columnar epithelium? Well, an example of ciliated simple columnar epithelium would be the epithelium that lines the ovarian tubes or uterine tubes, also called the oviducts. So uh, going back to last week, what were the function of cilia? Move materials, right? Do they move an entire cell around? No, but they just move materials across the cell surface. So why have a ciliated epithelium inside of the ovarian tubes? You got it, to move the egg. So these cilia actually will waft the egg from the ovary through the uterine tube towards the uterus where implantation of a potentially fertilized egg could occur. Okay? So the function of the cilia here in the uterine tubes, which is a simple columnar epithelium also, it's ciliated, uh, is to help move that material towards the uterus. What about non-keratinized versus keratinized stratified squamous epithelium? Well, keratin is a, is a type of protein that's really tough and also waterproof. Okay? In fact, nails and hair are made of keratin. And think about how tough hair is, right? You can, you can twine hair around into a rope, and that rope can be pretty strong. Like you hear about like stories like Rapunzel or whatever, like crawling out of her castle using hair. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if things like that had happened before you guys where people make rope out of hair and then use that to maybe pull on something or even get places because keratin is really, really strong as a protein. Nails are strong too. Like you can't just like break a nail off or away from the rest of the nail as long as your nails are like a normal structure, right? Well, what if I told you guys that your skin cells are packed full of keratin as well so that in the epithelium of your skin, it's chock full of keratin. We call this keratinized shreddified squamous epithelium. And it's the keratin that gives skin an additional sort of um, toughness to it. But keratin is also waterproof. So what does that tell us about skin? Can you absorb a lot of water through skin? No, that's not going to happen. You're not going to like go into a pool and then absorb a bunch of pool water in your body. That does not happen. In fact, it's a misconception that wrinkling of your fingers is due to water exchange from the pool in your body. That does not happen, you guys. You're not going to absorb water through skin um, because of keratin here. Now, uh, wrinkling is due to another phenomenon, which we'll talk about next week, but it actually involves your nervous system, not due to like loss of water or anything like that. So it's kind of interesting. But not all stratified squamous epithelium is keratinized. So if it's a non-keratinized epithelium, is it waterproof? No. So where might you find non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium? Think mucous membranes, like your oral cavity, uh, anal cavity, 
and uh, vaginal cavity, all of that's full of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, which means that it's not waterproof. So you can't absorb water through your mouth. Like if you just hold water in your mouth, you can absorb some water there. Okay? And um, water can go the other way too, which is what makes it more of a mucous membrane because water can leave across that epithelium and enter the space, like of your oral cavity, anal cavity, or vaginal cavity, right? Which makes it more of a mucousy type of cavity, if that makes sense. Because this type of epithelium here doesn't have keratin, which is therefore not waterproof, so water can go in either direction. Through, through osmosis, if that makes sense. So, um, if it's stratified squamous, do you guys think it's pretty tough? Yeah. Do you think this is really good at nutrient exchange? No. What would make this not a very good epithelium for exchange of nutrients? It's super thick, right? It would take a lot of diffusion to get a molecule to cross all of these cells. And it wouldn't make sense to have a night like a really thick epithelium for absorption or secretion. Okay, so what stratified squamous epithelium is best at is protection, and it makes sense to find it on skin, right, for the keratinized variety, because skin needs to be very protective. Why would it make sense for it to, to for you to find it like in the vagina or anal cavity? You guys can say it, it's fine. Protect against infection, but also, yeah, friction, abrasion, right? Think about, like, the anal cavity. Like, that could take a lot of abrasion from feces, right, or whatever. Um, same with the vagina, right? That could take a lot of abrasion, too. So it makes sense you'd want to have a tough epithelium there to prevent against any potential damage, if that makes sense. So um, that's why this epithelium makes sense to, to be there in the body. So where do you find keratinized stratified squamous epithelium? Skin. And where do you find non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium? Anal cavity? Vagina? And oral cavity. It makes sense in the mouth, right? If you're chewing on food, you don't want to have like a weak epithelium in your mouth because that food could just tear up your mouth. So in the oral cavity, you also have a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Good. All right, you guys. Um, so what about stratified cuboidal? Well, we typically find stratified cuboidal in glands. I think large glands, like oil glands, mammary glands, um, those are going to be made, uh, some sweat glands as well, those are going to be made of a stratified cuboidal epithelium. And how, how can we make sense of this? Well, uh, here's our space. Here's the epithelium. How many layers can we see here? At least two, right? I count one layer of nuclei here, another layer of nuclei on top of it. So it appears at least two, maybe more. And we can see that the cells maybe are sort of cube-shaped, so we see this as a stratified cuboidal epithelium. What if I told you guys that some secretions by glands are due to an entire cell bursting open? Like breast milk is made this way, where an entire cell bursts open and the contents of that cell become the secretion. If that were a simple epithelium, you wouldn't have an epithelium left, right? If the entire cell burst open and the cell dies, if it's simple, there's no extra cells to replenish those missing cells now. So with breast milk, uh, what happens is that we have a stratified cuboidal epithelium where the apical cells will burst open and the cytoplasm of that cell becomes the breast milk itself. But the basal surface of those cells can divide into new apical cells because the basal layer here could be like stem cells. Okay? Same with oil secretions, you guys. The oil that's secreted on your, on your skin or on your hair, those cells burst open, and the, the oily cytoplasm of those cells becomes the oily secretion of skin and hair, which is actually pretty crazy to think about it. Like, who would have thought that, like, breast milk or oil is, a, is just the contents of inside of a cell, which is pretty, pretty weird to think about. Yeah? It could be a hormonal thing. It could be uh, maybe damage to the lactiferous ducts. I mean, there's so many different varieties of things that could, could have gone wrong. Um, if my guess would though be the, the simplest answer, would probably be just a hormonal disturbance. But there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And you know, we'll come back to that kind of those kinds of questions also when we get to the reproductive system because we'll talk all about that, like the structure of mammary glands and how they connect and make breast milk and that kind of stuff. All right, guys, um, how about the stratified columnar epithelium? Well, this one's more rare, 
it's it's found in specific segments of the male urethra. Why is it there? I can't say, right? But you know it's stratified, which means it's more protective. It's columnar, who knows why, but you find it there. So specifically the male urethra. You don't find stratified columnar epithelium in the female urethra for whatever reason. Um, it just exists there. So you just want to know that that's one of its locations. Now, is the urethra a place where you would have nutrient exchange? No, because that's where urine's leading, right? Or semen if you're a male. Um, what about, um, are there any things in the urethra that could potentially be harmful to other parts of your body, like deeper tissues? Yeah, absolutely. Like urine's pretty acidic. You find bacteria in urine too. Like it's not true that urine's stale. That's a really common misconception. You know, if you ever watch the movie Dodgeball, like the guy's like, oh, I like I like the taste of urine. Or it's like, I like to drink my own urine because it's stale. I'm sorry, it's sterile, and I like the taste. <laughs> Which I know I'm like I'm like quoting a movie that's like 15 years old, but you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, it's not true that urine's sterile. Do not believe that. There are bacteria in urine, so that's not true. But you know. What that means then is that the urethra is a potentially harmful environment. So you wouldn't want like a very thin, you know, simple epithelium there because bacteria or acid could damage deeper tissue. So it makes sense to find a thicker epithelium here in the urethra. Um, and I think last but not least, you guys, actually, I'm no, two more. The last two ones, you guys, are the atypical epithelia. We have the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. If it's pseudostratified, what does that mean? It looks like it's stratified, but it's not, right? So it looks like it's stratified, right? Look at this. Like It looks like there's multiple nuclei that are stacked. Well, if you looked at this in three dimensions, it turns out that these cells aren't stacked on each other. It's just that their nuclei are kind of in different heights. So when you look at it in cross-section, it looks like the, the cells are stacked, but they're not. Okay? How, do you, how would one identify that? Like, like if you saw a slide like that? Like because this is the only one, this is the only pseudo-stratified pseudo variety you need to know. And this is, in fact, this is the only one that has cilia that you also need to know. Why is it structured that way? Because the, oh, I mean, uh, why are the nuclei in different heights? Yeah. Uh, if I had to guess, it'd probably be because just when the cells develop. Um, mm, I can't think of a good reason. Um, there might be a reason I can't think of one, you know. A lot of the stuff you just have to make an educated guess about. Um, that's a good question. Now, this has cilia, though. You can tell this is cilia because it has like kind of a shaggy hair appearance to this. Did you guys see this at all today in lab? Did, you guys, anybody, did anybody find pseudostratified columnar epithelium? Yeah, that was on your list, but if you didn't see it yet, we'll find it next week in lab, too. Um, and you can actually see the cilia if you zoom in, right? So this is the only variety that, that's pseudostratified and, and has cilia that you need to know. So if it looks like this, it, you know, if it looks stratified and has cilia, think pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And where do you find this epithelium? Respiratory tract, including the nasal cavity. So in your respiratory tract, in your trachea, and some of the larger bronchi have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. What do you guys think is the function of this epithelium? Protection, because the, the cell layer is pretty thick. And movement of materials. Why would you want to move materials around inside your respiratory tract? You got it because you're inhaling like a bunch of particles at any moment in time. Like although it seems like this air in the room is kind of clean and fresh, well, it's not totally clean or fresh. Like, you know, there are particles floating around, maybe fibers from clothes, fibers from the carpet, dust, dirt, bacteria, viruses. You know, other particles that are suspended in the air that we inhabit can be inhaled and they're going to get trapped in the mucus layer of our respiratory tract. And then once in that mucus layer here, we have the cilia that can actually kind of wave and waft that debris up and out of your respiratory tract through what we call the mucociliary ladder. So that's the function of this epithelium. What if I told you guys that cigarette smoke and components in smoke in general inhibit cilia? So it's a double whammy, right? You're not only inhaling debris, but you're also, inhi but you're also inhibiting the, the mechanisms that act to remove that debris. And that's why you know, smoke inhalation is particularly harmful to your lungs. In fact, there's some evidence now that like even those e-cigarettes um, are causing damage to lungs, um, because it, although it looks like you're inhaling nothing, like just they call it water vapor, there's there's still other um, particles that are suspended in that vapor that are being inhaled by your lungs, and nicotine inhibits the cilia, so it's having 
uh, also damaging effects. What we don't know yet, though, because e-cigs are such a new technology, is what, what are the long-term consequences of e-cigarette use? We don't know that yet, but there, you can already see that there's short-term damage in people who use e-cigarettes. Right? And that's not just nicotine. I'm talking about any kind of uh, smoke inhalation. So uh, what about transitional epithelium, you guys? Now, if you think about this word transitional, you might be misled to believe that you'd expect to find this epithelium transitioning between epithelial types. And that is not true. I remember like learning this as a student and seeing the word transitional epithelium and thinking, oh, hey, this must mean that when you transition from one epithelium to another, you must have transitional epithelium there in the, in the middle. You don't. In fact, transitional epithelium, I don't know why it's called that, but you find it on the urinary tract. So think bladder and urethra, parts of the urethra, can have transitional epithelium, oh, and ureters too, though. So the ureters are what carry urine from uh, your, your kidneys to your bladder, and the bladder is also lined with a transitional epithelium. If you looked at this epithelium, what might you be inclined to say? Like just looking at the epithelium type. What, is it simple or stratified? Stratified. What about the shape of those cells? Yeah, kind of cuboidal, right? So how can you tell the difference then between stratified cuboidal and transitional? Well, the apical cells are larger, and the basal cells are smaller. You don't see that in stratified cuboidal epithelium. With stratified cuboidal epithelium, typically the basal cells will be larger, and the apical cells will be smaller. Whereas when transitional, the apical cells are larger, and the basal cells are smaller. You might wonder, why have all these big old cells in this epithelium? Stretchability. And it makes sense, right? Your urinary bladder can stretch quite a bit, because it, when it fills up with urine, not only does the bladder stretch, but the epithelium that lines that bladder needs to stretch with it. So that transitional epithelium is really good at stretch. You also find uh, transitional epithelium in the ureters because when little blebs of urine come down from your kidneys, um, the ureters also stretch. And that's what helps bring urine towards the bladder. Okay. And that's 